Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Office Hours Saturday. We're here to answer your questions about media production. So get those questions into us via Makana, where you can also vote on other questions and live chat with the other producers. If you're not in Makana, just head on over to askofficehours.global. That's askofficehours.global, where you can get those questions in front of this incredibly knowledgeable panel 24-7. Let's get into the first question. TJ? First up this morning is from Pedro Gonzalez in Oklahoma. Pedro says, is there a way to set up a YouTube live stream to automatically start streaming daily from 1 to 3 p.m.? A set it and forget it approach is the goal. Jeffrey? There is a way, but it has to be on your end. Uh, YouTube doesn't really work that way for any type of scheduling. I, I, there's probably some websites out there, but uh, the way that I've done it was mostly through scripting, uh, being able to turn on and off. And uh, when in with YouTube, you, you can use the standard, if you have the ability to, the standard, uh, once you hit the, uh, the stream button, it will go through. Uh, but some people don't have that option in some cases, especially brand new channels. Uh, so you have to create, you have to create contained, uh, live events. And if you're doing that, then you're going to have to do that manually. Uh, there is no automated way for that, but, uh, for the most part, yeah, uh, the little script and you're good to go. Samuel. Yeah, or else you can do it on your end. It won't be completely set it and forget it, but you can set up live events and then set it to auto start. And then you can use something like companion or something to trigger it on your end to start the stream at a certain time. And Alex. Yeah, you can, the, the APIs will allow you to do many, many things with live streaming. So you can set that up. We've had it set up in a variety of different ways to get started. Um, you can obviously YouTube can be set up to um, stream when it starts receiving um, a signal. Um, not, that's not going to be on and off. I mean, you're going to have to create a new YouTube event. So you really need the API to create new events every single day. Um, but you could um, you know, set them up so that they will uh, start uh, streaming on the first bit. I'm not a big fan of these. I think uh, Mickey said he highly recommends, re recommends against it, and I do too. Uh, I wouldn't do anything automatically live, you know, so I don't even like to have it start streaming when it gets the first bits. I want to see the preview. I want to see what I got. I want to see, it's hard to pull it back and if you, unless you turn DVR off, you know, you can't take back whatever went wrong and things that go wrong during the event. I, 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 I don't know what your use case is, but I would highly recommend uh, there's almost every use case would be don't 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 do that. <laughs> like so so um you know like I, I don't know why you would want to do that. You know the only reason maybe if you've got a traffic camera or some kind of other thing, but I would really be be very careful about doing something that's set and forget because then you'll forget it and then something bad will happen on the live stream and you will have done it. <laughs> so 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 uh, it's easy to get strikes and all kinds of other things. And so I, I'd be very very careful of why you'd want to have something turn on and off. Um, you know, I, I feel like content is usually easy to watch or easy to make, but never both. Um, and so I think that, you know, making something set and forget, who's going to watch it? Like, why would they care? So so I think that that's the thing. I mean, you know, maybe if you have an eagle cam, maybe that might that might be a, a useful one. Samuel? Yeah, what, what I use the auto start uh, function for is that I set up like live events beforehand, like in church situations and stuff. And then operators that come in that maybe don't have the knowledge to operate uh, the YouTube uh, panel or we don't want them to operate it. We just uh, set them, just uh, press the button and then it goes live at a certain time. So that's my use case for using the auto start function. And Jeffrey? Yeah, and I've had this uh, been asked by other YouTubers. Uh, so basically they have their own room, their own studio where they just basically want to at uh, like 11 o'clock in the morning, all of a sudden the lights turn on, the cameras turn on, and they start streaming even though they're not sitting at their chairs. Uh, so they can keep the consistency going with their uh, with their audiences. And, but uh, as Alex said, that you have to really be concerned about uh, what ends up getting streamed, even if you're not there, because uh, you can get copyright issues. Uh, it, it, like if you're playing music in the background, that music's just kind of bleeding through because you got the door open, and then all of a sudden uh, you play an Eagles song, and then your stream just goes straight down. So that's I'd be a little concerned about doing that. Uh, or at least not having the audio on as one of the processes. Alex? Yeah, and the other thing I would say is that, you know, every time you stream, uh, if you have it set, if you're going to send out a notification to folks um, that you're streaming, 
if you do it over and over again and there's not good content to see, people will take it less and less seriously. So it actually damages your audience generally to be turning streams on all the time that don't have something compelling to look at. So I, I think I would be, you know, like we have discussions about whether we should have five minutes of pre-roll, pre <laughs> like five minutes of countdown clock, you know, let alone, uh, you know, putting something up that we don't think every day that is worth watching. So, so I think that that's the other thing to consider. Next question. From Douglas Carmichael. The Yamaha DM3 can run at 48 kilohertz and 96 kilohertz. For most audio tasks that aren't connected to video, would 96 kilohertz be optimal? TJ? So I know nothing about audio, so I asked our in-house audio guru here, uh, Mickey Makachor, and he gave me some notes, which I will... Um, he said that everything else, if you run at 96 kilohertz, also has to support 96 kilohertz. So make sure any, if you're using any uh, like virtual instruments or anything like that, they support that. Um, he says, uh, if you have a Dante network and you're running that... Um, the entire Dante network then would need to be run at 96 kilohertz. And often what will happen is that on a lot of Dante devices, you will lose half your channels because it has to allocate that uh, extra bandwidth. So it can, you'll get fewer channels. So if you had 96 channels, now suddenly you'll get 48 channels. And then he said, depending on your need, um, a lot of times you'll just get a larger file size and use more processing power for not much benefit. Courtney? Yeah, I, I agree with Mickey's suggestions and uh, relay from TJ. Uh, yeah, if unless the uh, client is requesting it and you're in charge of all the interconnections and all the, the equipment that's going to be used, I'd stay with 48. It's safe. Everything handles it. Uh, if you're not going to be changing the speed of anything, slowing it down, speeding it up to do special effects, uh, you know, you could do 96 of that as long as it's not sync sound. <laughs> so if you're going to be changing the uh, the speed of something, you could do 96. But it de it depends really on the, on the uh, you have to be in charge of setting up the project and interfacing that project to everything else, all the plugins, like Mickey said. So the safest way is to stay at 48. Uh, a lot of people say, well, I want to do it at 96 to future proof it. Well, you know. I don't think you're going to be alive long enough uh, for us to evolve to where we can hear above uh, 20,000 hertz. So I don't think you're going to be able to future-proof anything. Next question. Chuck Hodges from Tuolumne, California, via the QR code, says, With a budget for a lot of great gear, including the Bolero, why stay with the Constellation at the heart of it instead of budgeting for more consistently reliable industry standard or more powerful piece of hardware to send your signals through. Alex? The jump between a, from a Constellation 8K to something that is going to be significantly better is a big cash jump. It's not like a minor, like, oh, it's going to be another $5,000 or $10,000. You're really talking about going to, um, you know, typically some kind of Ross uh, switcher is going to be, and it's going to be significantly more expensive <laughs> for the same feature set. The other thing is, is that the Constellation has more I.O. than almost you know, most switchers under $200,000. So I'm not sure exactly which ones, but I know the last time we looked, I mean, you really had to have quite a quite a switcher to have 40 in and 24 out of a switcher. Um, so if you're trying to route things and trying to be able to grab onto things and, and adjust things for for those for that process, the Constellation is a very powerful switcher to use uh, for, for to make that actually work. Um, in addition to that, the, it can go up to 8K. So again, you have to also look at 4K. Um, you know, 8K, I don't know who's using that for live right now, but but 4K is a, uh, maybe some maybe this year, NAB, let's, let's just hope that that Blackmagic actually releases cameras that can stream out of the switcher and, and record the HyperDeck at 8K. That'd be great. Um, anyway, but... Uh, uh, but f even at 4K, if you go to, you look for 4K switchers and then say, okay, I want 40 in and 24 out. And I also want, oh, by the way, I want an open API that I can actually write to and, and um, you know, do a lot of work on the switcher remotely. Uh, try to find that under a quarter million dollars. You know, like it's, it really is and, and definitely under 60,000. So it's very powerful, um, especially if you have other black magic, uh, another black magic ecosystem. Um, I think that it's still a very, very, uh, I've done some pretty big shows and what the big advantage that I had also was that I had a primary constellation and a backup constellation, uh, because I can afford it, <laughs> you know, because, and, uh, so, you know, that, that's also helped as well. So th there's not much that competes with it in my opinion, under, uh, 30 or $40,000. Next question. 
Mark Giuliani from Washington, D.C. says, I am currently designing an addition to our radio station. The current scheme is a series of broadcast and podcast studios, each in a 20-foot shipping container. Where can I find accurate models of AV equipment for SketchUp? Alex, you may be able to find enough to hold the space inside a 3D warehouse. So if you're in SketchUp, 3D warehouse might have some of those um, those uh, devices. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I mean, if you're just trying to kind of lay things out, because really when you're laying them out, you don't really need them to be accurate, accurate. You just need boxes that are the right size. So, um, you know, so you may be able to find some of those things and you should probably contact me. I might have a couple cameras laying around in SketchUp. So, so, so try, try that as well. Courtney? Yeah, I was going to say contact the manufacturer. A lot of times they will have, uh, uh, they're not, not, you know, fairly dimensionally accurate, uh, not completely accurate because they kind of want to keep their stuff uh, proprietary. They also found a company called Trace Parts uh, that has a, a variety of rack mount equipment, uh, you know, accurately depicted in 3D and you can download those. Uh, so you might look there if you're looking for rack mount equipment if and server racks or whatever you're going to put in there, rack mount to hold audio gear. Um, and desk manufacturers, uh, a lot of desk manufacturers do have 3D models available uh, if you're looking to put in an AV desk or something that, that people are going to sit at work at. Alex? I do think with the, with the advent of, uh, you know, a lot of things like, you know, Apple Keynote and, and Pages and everything else supporting USDZ and a lot of AR stuff supporting USDZ. I think that we're going to see a growing number of dev of items that are available via US USDZ, and I think it's a real missing for companies to not have those those um, devices in, you know, that that are actually um, there. So, so keep your eye on that on that um, that mark because I think that there's definitely going to be uh, more of that. I think that one app that feels like it's missing right now in the 3D world is a basic layout app. So not not a modeling app. <laughs> like, it's just like, think of SketchUp where everything, but what you really want to spend time on, I've been thinking about this for the last couple of weeks. What you really want to spend time on is snapping and layout and being able to very quickly set points of rotation. But like, for instance, if I pull out a tripod, the tripod has little magnets on it that are like virtual magnets that sit on it that want to grab onto a floor. And so as soon as I say, this is the, as soon as I name something, the floor, the tripod just snaps to it, you know, like, and so, so the idea is that it just snaps to things and you can have things, you know, I've been really thinking about that design because I think that there's, you know, you don't, the problem we, we mostly have, like when we worked with electric image, one of the great things about electric image before it had a modeler was that it just threw objects in. You didn't think about whether you need, you could model them or not. And it really kind of uh, slowed things down to think about modeling. And, and, I, and, and so I think that for a layout program, there's a there's a program that wants to be made that you're just pulling stuff in and setting things on. And what you're spending all the energy on is is how easy it is to grab onto them and move them as opposed to, um, uh, and, and I can really see that putting the Apple Vision Pro on with things like uh, Jig Space, or um, uh, Jig Space, um, that is, uh, uh, that where you can very quickly grab things and move them over. It's just the key is the snapping, snapping and, and then, and then like you would have with, uh, it's instance control the way you have it in in um uh in sketchup where you can set all the stuff inside of like if i grab onto this and pull it up the legs will get longer you know if, and i can rotate things around you can build a lot of that into the instance inside of uh inside of usd well you could do it in usdz but you could also do it in in sketchup where you can set all the rules like this is how far the the seat opens and this is how and you can just grab it and pull it down and those things are all there i just feel like they're you know it's a, it's a it's a it's now becoming something where there's enough people doing it or enough people that might want to do it that it'd be worth doing. Before then, it was just too, there was just no business model for it. Mark? So for architecture, we use Revit. And what's really cool about it is that you see plans and elevations and sections all as you're drawing on the screen. Um, it does have snap points to the point where if you're putting a door in a wall, it'll snap it into the wall and then you can slide the door back and forth. But what would really be cool is what you were talking about, Alex, where if the devices, when they're built, had smart snap points. So where the quarter 20 connector on a camera is knows where the quarter 20 connector is on the ball head. So they just snap to the right place because you spend so much time moving things back it's, and forth in X, Y, Z. And again, you want to be able to also hand it to a producer or hand it to somebody else and um, and have them just model it, <laughs> you know, like, you know, or just then just throw things together. Like I, a lot, I model a lot of rooms. And so like, I, you know, I'm going, 
I've, I've learned not to say LIDAR because it scares people. So I just go, hey, can I take some 360 photos <laughs> with a BLK 360? And anyway, anyway so um, it takes a couple of measurements while it's, while it's taking photos. And um, the, uh, uh, but I build those rooms out so that we can figure out where we're putting things and so on and so forth. The, um, uh, uh, then what I want to be able to do is hand it to a producer that doesn't know anything about 3D and let them just put where they want cameras and lights and things. And that's what we're trying to get to. Alex, have you had any experience with uh, when you're when you're sending a, a USDZ file and an iMessage? You're limited to 50 megabytes, and I've found doing like some polycam scans of rooms, of like shop layouts and things like that, that I want to send them to people who don't have a 3D program. So uh, the first thing I'm doing is getting into USDZ. How do you compress those uh, yeah. when you're up against a ceiling? Yeah, and I think the ceiling. I, I, do, have you still had that ceiling problem? It, it's not. I'm not sure if it if it's still there, but um, but the other thing you can do is is you can put it somewhere like SketchUp, and you can put it in like Frame.io or put it in iCloud and send them a link. I think you can do the iCloud link to it. They may not be able to open it and use it in their in their um, phone, but they but they can get it. If you want them to use it in the phone, that fifty meg may still be a limitation. And what we use, which isn't necessarily a um, low lift uh, solution. It's not hard, but you need ZBrush. So ZBrush is an excellent decimator. Um, so it will, um, it'll do really, really good decimation um, of the, of the, um, the 3D file and then realign the, the, the texture map to it. So, um, so we use it to clean up, like when we're doing bigger scans, we'll throw it into, in, into ZBrush. And we, the reason we mostly use it is because we can paint the geometry. We can just paint little issues in the geometry um, and to, to kind of uh, file it out. But if you just take it in there and say, I want to have a target of 2 million polygons and, and whatever, it'll just figure out the best way to do that. And what it's looking for is break angles and edges and creases and stuff like that. It'll protect the creases and have edges long open spaces it'll reduce that geometry and so you'll see it instead of being a, a fully dense geometry you'll see it be like big open areas and, and then a lot of geometry where it needs to be i mean the really great one to do this with is a program called rainbow geomagic but that is like 20 grand or something like that <laughs> so, so it's and it does it really that's what we use for star wars and it's still around um i haven't used it for since i was working on star wars but but it was it was really good at decimation um a really smart decimation in that process and they use it in industrial so I can take pictures of an object and uh, remachine it. You know, like that's that's what that's what it's kind of used for. Um, but anyway, so you can use that to reduce that, um, and then you can use things like a substance to reduce the texture map uh, density as well. Um, you might be able to do that in ZBrush as well. I'm not I'm not certain, um, but you get great low quality, low not low quality, but low resolution or lower resolution because we've definitely taken things from. Uh, I've taken ones from that were gigabytes and got them down to 50 megs. Now I can see the difference, but it's as good as you're going to get for for the for that quality, you know, that quality. Thank you. Next question mm -hmm. from Gabriela Echasal Mestiera from Sault Ste. Marie. Gabriela says Wednesday, March 27th was Day of Giving for some companies who gave 100% of purchase prices to charity. Is this a good promotional model, and how would it, you apply it to your businesses? Will you be buying any products to support these charity initiatives? Jeffrey? So what that is, is uh, the Red Cross a annually does a day of National Giving Day. And the idea is that you give for disaster relief, whether it's donating blood, whether it's donating blankets, whether it's doing whatever. Uh, some of these companies, they'll do it because maybe the CEO had a disaster and they had the Red Cross ha have it happen to them. Uh, maybe they're doing it for a tax write-off. Maybe they're doing it because that's that's basically the group of people that they normally work with and uh, and work from there. Uh, you definitely want to help with the uh, relief of stock, stocking up, you know, like an ambulance or something like that during that day, if you can do that. Uh, the other thing is you do have to want, need to watch out for scams because they that's when scams start to uh, rise is during these days of giving. Uh, National Day of Giving also happens around uh, Thanksgiving as well. So it could definitely be something that's close to your heart. And yeah, for some people, it can be a tax write-off as well. And if you do have a cause that you're passionate about, sometimes there's uh, a great deal of awareness that gets brought about by some of these companies uh, advertising that they're giving some of their profits to a certain organization. Uh, but if they're near and dear to your heart, it doesn't hurt just to give to them directly. Next question. 
from Guy Cochran in Seattle, Washington. Besides being able to open a bottle of beer with your comms belt pack, was there any learnings from yesterday's studio tour? <laughs> Alex? I think that was the most impressive uh, set of um, of uh, stream decks I've ever seen. I mean, that was a lot of, that was a lot of stream decks. <laughs> so, so easy. But that was, I thought I was pretty impressed with that. Um, I, I'm, I, uh, I think that the, the, I've been seeing the, the 40 in action or the, um, the, the Ronin four, uh, was, was pretty, the, was pretty impressive, you know, like it was to see that kind of roaming around. Um, I think that it's really interesting to hear the business models of what, what's working for them. I think that that worked well. I think I'm not, st I'm still not sold on the, on the pinning. I mean, I understand there are some advantages to the pinning, but it seems, it seems, it's, it's, I was like, I don't know if I would do that again. Uh, you know, I didn't, I spent years pinning, I mean, like a decade pinning. So it's not like I haven't done it. I just, I wasn't sure if I'd ever, I, I kind of started twitching, looking at them. Um, but, uh, but I think that, uh, but I, I, I see why they would do some, why some of the needs are still there. Um, the, uh, but, uh, but it was really impressive and we really appreciate Guy going and, and walking us through that. It's really, really fun studio to, to walk through. And you can tell that they, you know, what's great about those kinds of studios is it wasn't built by an integrator. You can see that it was built by people doing the stuff and filling in what they needed as they needed it. Um, so I, I thought it was, I thought it was great. Courtney. And I learned that if you don't have the money for a Ronin, uh, of DJI Ronin 4D, you can take a chicken and strap a GoPro to its head <laughs> and use that as your steady cam because uh, they weigh a lot less than a Ronin 4D and they cost a lot less depending upon what the rate is per pound this week. That was a really fun analogy, but we uh, definitely were all had a lot of gear envy for a few minutes there, uh, maybe for, for most of the hour, just looking at how uh, impressive that studio is. Thanks again, uh, Guy and everybody at Tenacious for letting us take a peek in there. Next question. Lon Keller from Moorhead, Minnesota says, we have seen an alarming number of corrupt files when copying camera cards to the server using a new Mac mini with the latest version of Sonoma. We've read several posts about Sonoma causing corruption with something like offshoot help. TJ? I, I use a program called uh, Photo Mechanic and part of Photo Mechanic has a, a copy feature when you put the card in that will verify the copied file. And I was looking up uh, Offshoot and they talk about secure copying. So I'm guessing they may have a similar verification process. So something like that as the file is copied from the card and written to the hard drive to verify that the files match bit for bit, that would help. Um, secondly, if your corruption is actually, if it's actually corrupting your uh, memory cards, that's a different animal. And I would then um, go to a different computer and use different computer, different hardware to be copying those files off and then migrate that to the server. Jeffrey? Yeah, if it's coming from the card, then you have a more serious problem right there because it shouldn't be doing anything to the original file except copying it from one to the other. Uh, if you don't want to copy it to the hard drive, you can do something cloud-based and then send it from there. But the most important thing for me is uh, I always set up my cards and my drives. So once I record it, it stays on the drive until I know that it's in a secure place that has that is working and at least one backup is made even from that before I even go wiping the uh, cards, wiping the drives. But you can also get uh, card duplicators uh, that can sit right on the desktop and then you just basically put the card in, put another card in and then duplicate it. You'll have the backup, then you can uh, throw it into your computer for Sonoma. Mark? So uh, as I understand it, a lot of these programs like Offshoot are really just reaching out to the OS, their interface. They're reaching out to the OS. They're using internal OS commands. I don't know if the Mac Mini is the server in this situation, but one thing might be to create a step in between where you can zip the file and then putting it in that container might protect it from corruption. Next question. Dewey Evans from Bee Cave, Texas, also via the QR code. Dewey says, I'm going to begin broadcasting junior tennis matches with a coach paired with a student commentating. What budget cost mic headset would you recommend? Alex? Yeah, I don't, I, there's, it depends on, you know, how much you want to spend. <laughs> you know, so you can spend a lot of, a lot of money or a little money on it. Um, there's definitely, definitely little headsets that you can get. 
Uh, I, you know, I think that where they start becoming real broadcast headsets are the uh, Audio Technica makes a BPHS one um, that is uh, about two hundred nineteen dollars. Um, so I don't know if that's more than you. Yeah, Chris Sabato, um, who does a lot of this, by the way, uh, just put in the same num- the same thing. So um, BH a uh, BPHS one is probably the least expensive. Uh, um, uh, Mickey suggests the Sennheiser HMD 26. So these are um, these are two that that you probably want to look at. Um, they're both going to be, you know, probably a little bit more than you wanted to spend. But I think that you're going to find that those are the ones that are, they're pretty durable. Um, and I think that it, I think it'd be worth. And I will say that having something that really feels, doesn't feel janky and feels really like a real broadcast headset kind of ups the experience for the students. So if you can afford to f- find a way to do that, um, you may find that they, you know, they, it feels a little bit better for them and they play a little bit harder. Uh, Courtney. Yeah, I just found there's a, there's a cheaper one, uh, than the 26, the Sennheiser makes that you can find on Amazon for about 279. That is the H and B 300 pro broadcast headset, which might work for you. It's a lower cost, uh, not quite as good as the 26 go with the 26. If you get the money, it's a cheaper one there. Next question. <laughs> Eric Hertz from Hartford, Connecticut wants to know, can Dante Connect be used for video? Alex? I want to take a moment to say that Courtney just recommended something that was more expensive than what I recommended. I feel very proud about that. Anyway, so um, sent- March 30th, 2024, <laughs> March on your calendar. Yeah, exactly. So anyway, uh, Dante Connect. Um, uh, I don't know. I don't think so. I don't think that that's really uh, how it's built for, uh, for, for that, but we're going to find out a lot more about it. Uh, we've had a lot of great conversations, uh, thanks to Eric, uh, with uh, Audinate. And so we're going to have, we're going to see them at the booth. We're going to have uh, some extra time uh, in May or June to talk to them on the show. And uh, we hope to do some trainings with them. So, so stay tuned for all of that. Go ahead, TJ. Uh, not to out to Alex, but uh, from our um, audio guru, Mickey, Mickey says negative. Next question. Chester Sweeney from Las Vegas, Nevada, and by the QR code. Before the iPhone and Android battles began, what was everyone using to shoot low light video and photo scenes? Samuel? Uh, well, uh, if you really want to get a good low light uh, uh, footage, then you really need a full frame sensor. So it, I'm not as old that I know what everyone was doing for a long time ago, but at least in 2014, when I first got into this and got my first camera, then Sony released their uh, A7S uh, series, and that was uh, what was uh, was the best uh, low light camera at that date. And, and now, after that, they've uh, launched the S2 and S3, and now we have the FX3, uh, which is pretty much the same sensor. So that's what I would say, Jeffrey. I started with Canon uh, Handycam style uh, cameras, and then I switched over to Sony because of the sensor, because of the low light uh, that some of these cameras could do. Uh, of course, they were pretty expensive at that time. Now they're, you know, you could probably find them uh, at a Goodwill somewhere. Uh, but uh, those were some great cameras, and of course, Easy Cards. Uh, you could get 720p or 1080i uh, for the that type of uh, that type of uh, video. Alex. Uh, we still use uh, a different high uh, uh, when we're doing really low light cam- um, work. Just so you know that it exists. Um, this is I'm actually using this for a project coming up in next month. Um, this is a Canon. Um, this is an ME twenty F S H, but ME twenty is usually what we just call it. Um, and this is the the what we use for low light. Now th- this is a only 1080p. Um, and what they've done is uh, their sensor sizes are seven and a half times the size of, um, you know, f- for this. And so you end up with a, you, you want to pay attention to the number here to make sure that we don't, we don't miss it here. The reason that we use this is because the, uh, the sensor's equivalent sensitivity is 4 million ISO. <laughs> so, so the, uh, um, let me see if we can pull that up. Nope. Sorry. I just hit the wrong button there. Um, yeah, 4 million ISO. So that's the, Sorry, I hit a whole bunch of buttons there that didn't work, didn't do what they were supposed to do. Um, but uh, we can see things in a theater, for instance, that the audience can't see. You know, so so like that we had we had a situation we were doing something where the audience said, "Can you see us?" Like we're in a theater looking at, and the person looking at him said, "I can see the purple uh, uh, the purple band on your on your uh, wrist and." the audience member couldn't see that on their own wrist. So, so, it, so it, this is a very, very low light camera. Um, so you can get to, to those very, very low light um, areas. 
most of the cameras, A7S is obviously very good at it. Anything with a full frame sensor is going to have a better uh, low light capability um, than, than what the cameras used to do. But the cameras have now passed it with computational photography um, than most of the cameras. So un unless you're getting a specialty camera like what I'm talking about, they're not that much performant from a low light perspective. They're not that much better than, than, uh, than what, what the cell phone is going to do. Courtney? Well, I may be showing, yeah, I may be showing my age, but we used to use um, Kodak uh, 500 ASA film, 16 millimeter, and push it two stops in the lab. Next question. Ronnie Hofse from Tromso, Norway. Now that Zoom has released their developer API for Zoom, who is playing with this and is there something we could show? What about starting a lab hour for this specific plugin? Alex? I think, I think the lab makes a lot of sense. So let's take a look at when we can do a lab where we can all know that there's a time we're all going to get together and talk about it. I'm very excited about this. We just haven't had time to dig into it as much. It's just been a lot with NAB coming up. But we do expect, um, we expect to use it. We expect a lot of members to use it. So stay tuned. Next question. From Alexander Knight in Port Coquitlam, British Columbia. Have any of the MIMO live sessions been recorded? I'm particularly interested in setting up Zoom integration and piping out each participant through the built-in HDMI ports of the GPU on my Mac Pro. Alex? I, I don't know why you... So the, Mim, the Mimo Live, I don't think they've been recorded to answer your question. And I also don't think that... Uh, and I, we're still... A lot of us are still you know, playing with Mimo on, on, in the Zoom integration. I don't know why you use Mimo for that, given that you have a product that is designed for that, which is called Zoom ISO. So unless you're trying to save money on it or not pay for one, both or, or something else like that, but Zoom ISO does exactly what you're talking about. It'll push, it'll push out whatever you want. Now, the problem with any HDMI output from a Mac is that they will, um, it'll put that little orange dot in the upper corner. Um, so uh, so that what you're going to want to look at is getting some kind of SDI interface out. Um, you can convert it back to HDMI if you want, but the SDI will not have the, the orange dot. The HDMI will. Um, and so that's going to be the challenge that you have there trying to push multiple feeds out. But you're asking, the other thing I would say is that the Zoom ISO can do that in its sleep. Um, I, I think that you would start to over push most computers if you started to um, add more outputs through a, a, an in-between software like Mimo. So I don't think you'd have nearly the same performance trim as you do with uh, Zoom ISO because it's been optimized for that. Mark? Uh, if this is a recent Mac Pro, I think there's only two HDMI ports. Well, so if it's a, if it's a recent Mac Pro, you could put a card in and then that card could be a quad card, which means that you could have eight, eight outputs. You could have multiple card card. I'm fairly certain that a fairly well allocated Mac Pro, if it's a new Mac Pro, um, it uh, would be able to, you'd be able to put 16 out without getting over 60%. Next question. Ike Potter in Hanover, Germany. What is so special with the USB-C Ethernet adapter for the new Mevo Core Cam that makes it cost $199? Go ahead, Jeffrey. Uh, the reality is that Mevo has uh, sold that same uh, same Ethernet uh, plug for uh, since their start, and it's always been that price. Uh, the big thing is uh, support, and I think I don't know if it's still warranty. There was one point where they said if you plug in another one, you and it damages, you might uh, ruin your warranty on that. So for the most part, part it's convenience, and this is not a new thing for anybody. You know, like PTZ cameras sell like three hundred dollar pieces of metal for uh, that are stands for your uh, for your camera, and they know that people just want to say okay yeah just just get it uh so they'll end up buying it uh just uh, just because it's there next question from craig mcfarland in boston massachusetts craig says the td from yesterday's studio mentioned he was looking at a stream deck mount that has a raspberry pi built in is that for a companion go ahead jeffrey it is. Uh, so Raspberry Pi has a companion module that uh, that you can then connect it and it becomes a very remote uh, remote device. You can even put in an external battery and then have it uh, cord free so you can roam around with uh, with that device. I didn't see that part of yesterday's show, so I'm not exactly sure why he's looking for it, but that's what I, I would look for one. Courtney? 
Yeah, because it offloads. You don't have to hook it up to a PC. Uh, so the the companion the uh, companion four B is what you look for. It's a it's a complete installation of uh, uh, Raspberry Pi uh, on a uh, companion on a Raspberry Pi. It's an image for the four B Pi, and that way you just have to hook up an Ethernet cable and uh, go from there. Let the stream deck envy ensue. We all. I, I thought I had enough. I, I need a double decker. Uh, next question. Pedro Gonzalez from Oklahoma. Is it just me or did the quality of YouTube live streams go up? I've noticed a smoother and less pixelated streaming experience on multiple channels. Alex? Uh, this largely has less to do with YouTube and more to do with uh, the, the streamers using better uh, software or hardware to do it. Uh, YouTube has been capable of very, very high quality live streams for a decade, um, definitely over the last five years. And really the problem was people using trash to send the bits into YouTube. So, um, you know, so that's, that's really the problem is more garbage in, garbage out. Um, because I've, I've streamed, I, I streamed my first 4K uh, live stream into YouTube in 2017. So that was a solid seven years ago. And it looked better than any broadcast <laughs> that I've seen. Um, and, uh, and it was, it, it looked, it, it looked really, really, really good. And, uh, that, uh, it wasn't a YouTube. It's not YouTube. When you see the pixel of the pixelization, you, what you're seeing is people cheaping out on their encoding. Um, it's not YouTube being able to deliver it. And even when you're looking at broadcast channels, because the broadcast channels are still being, if you look at YouTube TV and you go, why is it so pixelated? It's because it's because some broadcaster is cheaping out on how they're encoding. And so, which is, I know, millions of people watching, why would you do that? I don't know. I don't know why they do that. Um, and I think it's, you know, it's oftentimes someone penny pinching over something that isn't worth it. But um, they decided it was. <laughs> so it was uh, like, we'll have millions of people watching, but we'll make the signal look bad. And I think sometimes they want to protect their main broadcast signal. Um, but, uh, but I think that it's, it, so that's frustrating. But YouTube itself is capable of delivering in a, in a, a, the high, one of the highest quality streams available um, uh, out there for a Jeffrey? public CDN. Well, I totally agree with what Alex said. Uh, YouTube is always tweaking. They're always updating their their software, their hardware uh, in, in the back end to try and make it for a better experience. But I think the bigger reason is the fact of the last year, year and a half, there was a major push for bandwidth increase. In fact, they just, they just set the standard from, what was it, uh, 20 down, 5 up to like 100. 100 down 20 up uh for the average user in the united states at least so uh now we have better bandwidth options to choose from and so people can get on and they can uh, they can do their live streams from their homes without having drops or uh, as many drops or signal degrations as even uh say 18 months ago alex yeah and you shouldn't be streaming anything with you with a connection that isn't reliably at 10 megs a second like period like you shouldn't do that <laughs> like you know don't do that to, your, to people watching um so uh you know so that's that's the that is table stakes um and so so and, and again you have lots of creators who don't know better that are just putting out you know stuff like they've got obs and they've got a thing and they're going to do it with wireless and they've got a bunch of whatever and that's why you end up with bad streams on youtube um and so but if you use a a professional level encoder with enough bandwidth, the YouTube stream will look amazing. Next question. Eric Hertz from Hartford, Connecticut wants to know, what is the best flavor of HDR? DJ. I want to say mint chocolate chip, but in all seriousness, uh, when I'm looking for a movie, I will always gravitate towards the Dolby Vision version of it. My understanding is that Dolby Vision, you can set the metadata uh, for each individual scene so that um, you can have the video highs and lows or the brights and the darks set per scene in a movie or a show as opposed to something like HDR10 where you're setting the manifest and it's like it covers the entire range of the show that you're doing. But I'm sure Alex will correct me. Alex? No, that's that's mostly accurate. Um, so the uh, uh, the um, uh, it's not per scene, it's per frame. So it, it, it ends up being per scene, but it is per frame. Now, HDR10 will do the same thing, HDR10 plus. So HDR10 does those trims. So there's a max fills and max CLL that are setting the overall. And then you have trims for the red, green, and blue. 
And what happens is, is there's none of that in HDLG. So HLG is the easiest one to do production on. The problem with HLG, if you look at the curve um, of HLG here, you have um, HLG basically wants to look good on 709, Rec 709 as well as HLG. So it largely looks like a 709 and then it just curves off at the end to give you more, uh, more data there. When you look at a um, when you look at HDR or Rec 2020, the Rec 2020 or HDR 10, or a, when you look at the PQ curve, let's be more accurate there. Um, you're going to see a, a, a much softer curve here, like this. Now, the, the the cost of that, I'm not being totally accurate here, but you get the idea. Um, the 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 reason that this is important is that in a 10 bit solution, a 12 bit solution, I don't know if it matters. In a 10 bit solution, it means that you have more more area here to um, this area here uh, that's, 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 it means that, that as it goes, as it goes across the, the, you know, dark to, to, to light, you have more bits to work with to, uh, to describe that information. So the PQ curve gives you more room to work. Now, it also means it looks really bad if you don't have something that's going to look at it. HLG will look good, look reasonably good on, on a, on a Rec 709. Now what, so there's, that's the, the PQ curve in, in my opinion is, is better than the, um, than the HLG curve because of that. Then when you add uh, metadata, now what the, what HDR 10 does is it adds that metadata for the entire, C, the entire project. So if you watch a movie that's got, this is your, your, your um, these are where your highlights are going to be as far as a, a high point and these are where your midpoints are going to be. It's going to set that for the whole thing. And that's better than nothing. Uh, it's better than HLG in my opinion. Um, but then HDR 10 plus and, and HDR 10 plus, by the way, is Samsung is too cheap for Dolby. So anyway, so um, the, uh, but Dolby, uh, and the reason that I don't like HDR 10 plus is because HDR 10 plus is a way to save money. Dolby fo is, is a company focused on a few things, one being Dolby Vision. And so you have someone, you have a company working on it all the time versus someone that's just trying to cut a corner, you know, and, and, I, and I feel like, the, you know, as far as devel overall development, you want to be on the side of people that are working on it all the time. So, so the, um, uh, the, so the, the issue there is that, is that with um, Dolby Vision, they're, they're setting that at every frame. Um, and that's going to give you, in my opinion, a better a better solution. So I agree with uh, with TJ that Dolby Dolby Vision is going to be the best. Um, HDR10 Plus is the second best. HDR10, the third best. HLG is you know we're happy to be here. Next question from the QR code drop. Chester Sweeney in Las Vegas says, "I want to listen to Jimi Hendrix the way he intended: tape, record, eight track, stereo, or mono." Alex? I think what he intended was whatever came out of his guitar. <laughs> like, you know, I don't think that he cared. I don't think if you asked Jimmy, if, if you had Jimi Hendrix now, I bet you he'd just be listening to it on his, you know, whatever, his head, you know, his uh, phone or whatever. I don't think, I don't think, I think a lot of artists don't really care that much about the medium in which their art, their music is listened to as much as they, as they care about the, the content itself. Jeffrey? Yeah, I think the answer would actually be live, but that's almost impossible. I know that there's a few uh, different uh, uh, tribute artists out there that do Jimi Hendrix, and, and going to see them live would probably be the best answer. And of course, you know, uh, tape record, eight track, uh, that was, I, I'm not sure how much tape was introduced at that point, uh, but definitely eight track and reel to reel or record. Uh, but if, yeah, if Jimi Hendrix was alive today, he'd have so many other options. He did start Electric Ladyland, uh, and I think that was just so they could make their albums at a cheaper rate. But, uh, you know, it, it really depends on what Jimi Hendrix would be like today as opposed to back in the 60s when he had very limited options in recording than what we do now. Courtney? Well, I disagree with both of you because I was a child of the 60s and I owned <laughs> Electric Ladyland albums and Jimi Hendrix albums. And uh, uh, it was the psychedelic era, remember? And if you listen to All Along the Watchtower on headphones, best way to listen to it, stereo, uh, stereo disc recording, vinyl, uh, you'll hear that all the funny things that they did in the mix, they would have his guitar would move left to right and the delayed echo would move in the opposite direction. So they'd be reversing directions throughout your head as he's playing his guitar solo. So there's tons of stereo tricks that are performed on that album and you will miss them all if you listen in mono. And uh, it, it really adds to the experience of Jimi Hendrix. Jeffrey? 
But Courtney, the real question is, was that Jimmy that, that made those decisions or was it his audio team that made those decisions? Because he had a pretty crack audio team that was behind his albums after, uh, after he became famous. I think it was both of them. I think they collaborated together on that. And if you, you can tell that the, the amount of care that went into uh, mixing those albums is, is amazing for that period, 1968, remember? Agreed. Well, the tape that's running in the rest of the panel said this morning will surely be Purple Haze. Uh, thanks, Jester. Next question. Jeff Bailey from Henderson, Texas says, I'm seeking a tool that will perspective warp an image as if you're looking at it from an angle. This will be used to fill a green screen on a secondary cam via ATEM. Media modifier is okay. Any other recommendations? Alex? Yeah, it's one of the it's one of the few things that the ATEM has that you, you really wish it had perspective, a 3D transform, um, and there isn't a good good perspective. And so as a result, you get kind of caught up in using software. The problem with software when you start adding perspective to it is that you're going to lose frames, probably two or three, um, as you do that processing. And so there while there are some software tools that you could do that with, many different software tools. I mean, you could use Mimo Live or VMix or or I don't know of many that are just dedicated to doing this one thing. But there's, you know, as far as making those transforms, but you're going to you're going to have some latency issues. So if it's a still, it won't matter. If it has to time up, it's going to be a problem. I would also back up and just ask yourself how, what you're doing with that and why you're doing it. Um, even when used on a large broadcast like the Super Bowl, I think that uh, forced perspective on 2D planes looks junky. <laughs> like, you know, so, so, and, and I'm saying that as someone who used to use it all the time. Um, but I really just kind of got to a point where it's kind of like, uh, using crazy transitions in, in your switcher. Um, I, I don't know, like I, 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 I literally wince literally every single time, um, I see a broadcaster on a football game, use those cheap little perspective things. Um, they, they have all these great graphics and then they throw these little cheap cards in and give them a little perspective. It really makes me ill. So I, I don't know why, I don't know, I don't, I wouldn't do it if I could avoid it. You know, like I, I really would be careful of, of, of why you're doing that. Next question. Eric Hertz in Hartford, Connecticut asks, how can I bring siphon sources into Unreal? Alex? If you're using a Mac, you could bring siphon sources in, but I wouldn't use Unreal on a Mac. Like I just really wouldn't. It's it's really a painful um, approach. It's one of the few you know a few reasons for me to have a PC <laughs> is to is to have Unreal on it. Um, and Unreal has a variety of different uh, sources, uh, a, a variety of different ways of of um, whether it's NDI and now Zoom directly will go directly into into Unreal. We're going to talk about that on Tuesday with Nick Justishin. So um, so I would ask that question again on Tuesday. Nick Justin's going to be here talking about the new integration between Zoom and, uh, and Unreal, but I'm sure he'll be able to answer a lot of other questions for you as well. Next question. From Alexander Knight in Port Coquitlam, British Columbia. Is there an attractive way I can bring in chat comments from a YouTube live stream into my ATEM? I think that will make the show better. Go ahead, Samuel. Yeah, there are several tools uh, for this. You could use like your Raspberry Pi, for example, and then use uh, HDR graphics. Uh, John Barker, he has a solution for this. Also, uh, vMix, if you, uh, maybe not on an ATEM, but you can do a chat comment from vMix and uh, log in there. They have integration. Uh, but uh, uh, And also another thing you can do is uh, socialstream.ninja. That will scrape the comments directly from the YouTube so you don't have to log in or get into the APIs because it will scrape the front end. So that could be some suggestions. Next question. Craig McFarland from Boston, Massachusetts says, now that spring is here, what are you purging from your setup to clean out your office? Jeffrey? That's a darn good question. Uh, so as some of you know, uh, I went through a major move over this, uh, this last year. And so what I did was, uh, as I was moving, I would deem things, uh, something that I need, absolutely need comes here. And then stuff that I didn't need goes to the uh, storage locker that I, that I set up. Now, come April, it's time to go over to the storage locker and go through everything that I put in there and see if it's time to sell or if it's time to keep. It's kind of like that whole... Uh, thing uh, the, the Japanese uh, feng shui uh, person that she would go okay put it in your closet put it over to the other side and if it sits there next month it's time that uh, that that item goes to goodwill so that's basically what I was doing was I separated it out and now it's like 
did I live without it for the last three months? Yeah, it's time to get rid of it. Alex? For me, I'm mostly just sorting. I'm just getting better at having the shelves that I need uh, available and then having boxes on them to put things in. And then when things don't have a box, they get thrown away or they get given away or put somewhere else. But they, you know, it's, it's uh, if I don't have a place to put them that I, and I think I haven't used them for a long time, as Jeffrey said, then I get rid of them. Uh, the problem for me is that a lot of things that I have, like right now I'm building up some kits. There were some things that were sitting there for years and I'm really glad I have them. <laughs> so, so, uh, so I, I think that uh, it's it's hard for me to give them away that quickly. But there's definitely things that I'm um, I'm pretty ruthless. I fill up like I wait until the every week. I wait until to see how much is left in my trash, and then I fill it up with things from my garage. Like I just literally throw things away every single week um, to try to slowly cut through all of the the stuff that I'm not using. Next question, Ike Potter in Hanover, Germany says. Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Cameras can be used as webcams via USB-C with the new firmware 8.6. Is it possible then to use autofocus by the ATEM software control app by connecting via HDMI, or does one need to press the cam button? Alex? I need, we, need to, we need to look at it more, more carefully. Um, I think that it just came out. We're excited about it. It's one of the big, our bigger updates we've seen in a long time. Um, and uh, we haven't had time to, I haven't had time to install it on a bunch of, uh, or on a camera yet. So, um, so anyway, so I think that we'll stay tuned for, for that, but we'll, we'll get it installed. I'll get it installed over by the end of next weekend. Uh, I have a bunch of things this weekend, but by the end of next weekend, I'll have it installed on a Blackmagic camera and we'll see if we can't figure it out. I think the other thing that we're all going to be looking at as we're uh, interfacing with an, a new Blackmagic device over USB-C is how does, uh, how does it deal with the black crush or the video compression over the... Uh, USB think, signal. I'm going to guess it looks exactly the same. Fingers crossed. Yeah. Next question. Jeff, Jeff Vealy from Henderson, Texas says, any spec recommendations or things to avoid when buying several TVs for displaying Zoom galleries in a studio? Mark? Well, there is one cam one monitor made by LG that has the ability to show four screens at once, and I'll show it to you here for a moment. And uh, it has four HDMI inputs, and so you could put multiple galleries in that way. That's what I use for multi-view out of an ATEM. Courtney? Uh, don't worry about, um, well, you, I would go for 4K, uh, even though uh, you're only going to have 1080p maximum coming out of your Zoom galleries. Uh, it has a tighter dot pitch, and if there's these uh, TVs are going to appear on camera and you end up zoomed in on one, you won't get as much more ray out of a 4K uh, panel than you will out of a 1080p panel. Also look for game mode in the uh, video setup of that TV. If it has a game mode, that's the low latency mode where the TV doesn't do any uh, processing or interpolation of the incoming video frame. So it'll be the lowest latency input uh, from uh, HDMI input to pixel output. Alex? I, t I tend to um, prefer to not, not put the multi... Uh, screen into the monitor. I want to have something on the outside of it. So there are uh, a variety. Black Magic makes some, but there's also a variety of multi-view um, pieces of hardware that you can get. And that way, you have a cheap piece of hardware that you can add to any monitor and make it a four-up um, if you want to. But the LG one is very nice. But I, I like to keep those things modular so that I can move them around. Uh, I would recommend, um, you know, 55 inches is the, is the size that most of our TVs are that we use for galleries. Uh, they are 4K, so that we can do four splits if we um, if we want to. So that is something that we um, uh, uh, these are. Um, host only and he said these are about 58 inch is what what jeff added to it um but yeah i think that that the um 55 to 58 that's great um it's going to give them enough viewability uh for for that process um but you may want to do four ups and so 4k makes it makes a difference there i mean the other things are very basic but make sure it's got an iec c13 cable so that you don't have any external like i, I just really am, am dogmatic about that it makes life so much easier when you have all your monitor i have one monitor that i that i found somewhere i mean i had we had it in pixel core or whatever that uh has doesn't have an, a, a c13 cable and i i swear at it at least once a week um you know because of that the um uh so then hdmi of course input some are some are not <laughs> that's why i say that over and over again and you got to have a visa mount so you got to make sure that you can mount it to something and once you get to 55 you should have that but there are some artsy ones that are less expensive that don't have uh of uh that don't have a visa mount and that's really annoying next question 
From Tony Mobley in Noonan, Georgia, Tony says, I am speaking at the House of Worship tomorrow. I will not be at my setup for health reasons. The person who will run PowerPoint will not be available. Can I run PowerPoint on my iPad Pro, Sermon on the MacBook Pro? Will that work? Alex? Yeah, the it's it, it should work. You should have a PowerPoint on there. I, I will say that I'm not entirely certain um, because I would never run PowerPoint on a on an iPad. I mean, like Keynote is, if you're talking about you want to run Keynote on your iPad, it works great. Like I do that all the time. And you can draw over it. You can do a lot of other things. And it's it's a really easy thing to do. In fact, <clears throat> my favorite way to do it is a lot of, I travel with one of these Apple TVs. And so when I go to the tech person that is going to do something, I haven't done, haven't had to do this for a while, but I've done it for, I did it for a decade. I'd plug this in, then I could walk around with my iPad and I didn't have to worry about it being attached to anything and just do, and just have it send out the, send it out over AirPlay to the, to my uh, Apple TV. It's great. Jeffrey? I will add Ethernet connection to that. Uh, so you're absolutely sure that that signal is going out of the iPad, getting to the house of worship uh, that for whatever, however it, the setup is. Next question. Eric Hernandez in Hartford, Connecticut. When I am recommending 4K, what is the best way to respond to the haters who say it is not necessary? Go ahead, Jeffrey. It is not necessary. Did I just say? It? Okay. Uh, the reality is, you know, that it really depends on what they're doing it for. Uh, if you're live, if you're recording, if you're doing both. If I'm recording, I try to record in 4K. If I'm live streaming, I, you know, a lot of times the bandwidth and, and other requirements, 1080p is fine. We're not at that point of doing a lot of live streaming 4K. Uh, if somebody's not watching it on a TV, a, a major monitor T or TV or uh, something like that, they miss out on the 4K anyway. Yeah, it does look a little bit better on an iPhone, but it's still an iPhone out of there. Uh, it also depends on how it's being streamed, if it's being streamed to YouTube. If you're going to a regular TV signal, even ATSC 3.0, yeah, you can have a channel that does 4K, but most channels are 1080p because a lot of these TV stations want to have the primary channel and then like seven secondary channels with uh, old TV and movies that are running. So they'll use that bandwidth and then their primary channel will at best be 1080p. So there's there's a lot of reason that 1080 is still uh, very important. And if you think about it, uh, you know, like when Twit even... Uh, back when we were all trying to do 1080p, they were still streaming at 360. And it was about uh, having a better signal, a better look. And their, yeah, their video was always crisp and clean and, uh, and without too many errors. Whereas if you're trying to stream 4K with, uh, with bandwidth that you don't have or equipment that doesn't do the job right, then you just run into a whole bunch of problems. Courtney? If you're talking capture, uh, 4K is an easy sell because then you can say, well, even if you're going to end up at 1080p, you have the flexibility of taking a section of that 4K and blowing it up and uh, giving you a lot more variety of coverage uh, out of that uh, 4K unit. You can resize it without uh, paying the penalty of uh, making pixels that are uh, visible or creating aliasing issues. Uh, so there's that. If you're talking about uh, viewing, if uh, they're going to be sitting closer than three feet to the monitor, yeah, it makes a difference. If they're sitting further away, you know, than five to ten feet away, if you're talking about a, a monitor in a room, uh, if you're, you know, a, a reasonably sized 50-inch monitor, if you're more than about five or six feet away, you're not going to be able to see the difference. Uh, so it depends on if you want to save money or not. Almost all panels these days are 4K anyway. So uh, there's that consideration. In fact, I think you pay more for a 1080p panel uh, because they're not uh, being manufactured. In. Alex? TCL HDR uh, TV now is 85 inches at $850. I know because we're getting one further for the booth. Um, uh, the, the size of that monitor does make a difference. As you go up over 65 inch, you, you know, 10 feet away, you're going to be able to tell the difference. And the bottom line is, is that what I will say all the time is that uh, how you separate from, from other people around you is to do more than what's necessary. When people say that's not necessary, I stop thinking that they really care. <laughs> like, you know, so, so that, you know, like only doing what's necessary is, is a great way to stay inside of a commoditized box. Commoditized boxes are a horrible place to do a business. 
Stick around. Uh, we've got more questions coming up in the second hour. Also stick around uh, to the whole community. It's a wonderful time to get involved. Uh, we've got a lot coming up. We've got the eclipse is happening a week from Monday and then NAB at the end of that week. Uh, tomorrow we have our Sunday show, which is a streamed only, not recorded. It's more of an introspective way for us to take a look at ourselves. What do we like? What do we not like? Joys and concerns. And uh, really more of a philosophical day. Uh, but we've got a ton of stuff coming up again about the eclipse and the NAB. So head on over to officehours.global, click join us, sign in, get the newsletter, and then you'll be able to keep up on everything that we're doing. And welcome back, TJ. Let's hop in the next question. Douglas Carmichael says, Jeffrey, I like your comments about downsizing. Do you find you are more productive with a few versatile pieces of gear in the studio than having more gear and being overwhelmed by your choices, especially with music projects? Go ahead, Jeffrey. Well, first of all, I do have to mention that uh, the storage also does a, a second purpose, and that is I don't have uh, a regular studio uh, at this point in time. Everything is meg shift. So... Uh, uh, a lot of the studio pieces are sitting in storage until I get the right place that has the ability to bring those back in. Uh, for that, as that's as said, uh, a lot of that stuff that is in storage that I had talked about earlier about uh, doing the downsizing, it was stuff that I wasn't using anyway. In fact, uh, you know, like old cameras, old uh, old uh, switchers, old capture devices, uh, anything that wasn't too expensive. You know, like my ATEM Mini is actually sitting right behind me. Uh, so if I need to use it for whatever, then I can pull it out. But I don't use it on a regular basis because I do a lot of NDI uh, recording and streaming rather than uh, H uh, HDMI because that's a lot less cables. On that same token, I have a lot of cables sitting in my storage locker. Uh, and the reality is I'll probably never get rid of those HDMI cables because until they just stop working and then they get thrown away. Uh, because you never know when you get into a project where you're going to need it and then uh, and then you have it there as you go from there. So I, I, it, is, it is a nice thing to kind of get it out of your eyesight. But also remember that you got to remember that it is an eyesight. So what I would, what I did was I actually put a calendar date in. And I said you're going to your storage locker and you're going to spend the day and sorting through a whole bunch of stuff and seeing what you can sell and what you can give away and what uh, just basically will go into the trash can. Courtney, yeah, Douglas, I find that when I go through my storage and find an old synth that I haven't, you know, plugged in in years and. I go, I, I need this space. I got to take this. I'll take it over to Goodwill and dump it off. And the next day I'll read an article about this much sought after rare synthesizer that I just took to Goodwill two days ago that has now become the darling of all the uh, retro musicians out there that are searching for all this retro gear to give it a new life. But uh, so I'm still holding on to everything. Next question. Guy Cochran from Seattle, Washington says, no need to sing. However, can we say a quick get well soon and happy birthday to our pal, John Prado? Hey, I think that if it's, I think if, if this is John's birthday and he's listening, uh, John may not be here with us today, but I still think we should sing him happy birthday. If this, you know, so, cause it's, he's, he's been here more than anybody else. So, um, so anyway, so, okay. Are you guys ready? Are you ready? Uh, George, yeah, I'll, ready. Start. I'll start. So no, all, you no, do is, no, no. all you have to, no, all you have to do is you have to follow me. You just just try to sing with me. You'll be behind me, but you will all try to sing. Just just listen to mine. I'm gonna sl I'll sing slowly, and then we'll do the best we can to make this car wreck look less car wreckish. All right, ready? Here we go. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. you. Happy, Happy birthday. birthday. And, and Ryan, and Ryan. Ryan's Ryan Raiden. And Ryan Raiden and, and John. Oh, Ryan Raiden and John. How you? <laughs> Take two, Ryan and Raiden. get well soon. <laughs> yeah. So, so anyway, so get well soon, uh, John. We can't wait to have you back on the panel. Um, so, and we'll be seeing you when we're in Vegas. All right. Let's go to the next question. Sorry. I thought I took CJ's thing. <laughs> Brian Taylor from Washington, D.C. via the QR code drop. 
there is a recent controversy over the use of AI art in the recent well-received horror film Late Night with the Devil. The Office Hours take is... Courtney? Well, I looked at this article, and it seems that they used... Uh, this is a low-budget horror film, and they used... It takes place, I think, back in the 70s. They used AI, apparently, to generate some stills for interstitial stills, like the Johnny Carson stills that they bumper stills they put in for, we'll be right back with late night. You know, uh, the cheesy looking stills, they used AI uh, mid journey or something to create. And then they had an artist modify them. So there's no, not a big deal. Maybe they released this information or it escaped uh, to create con controversy to drive box office because these days, I find that anything that is uh, unique will drive the box office up, like the uh, 1570 prints of uh, Dune or uh, uh, <clears throat> Oppenheimer, you know, drove uh, those theaters were sold out for uh, the entire run of the film, which they hadn't done in years and years and years. So something unique about the film can drive a uh, box office. And I think a lot of buzz or controversy stirred up about something that is just not pretty inconsequential. Uh, you know, you, you could have created that stuff themselves or, or it, it, I don't think they took a lot of jobs away from a lot of uh, uh, graphic artists to create those five or six stills. Alex. The only reason that I, uh, that I know that this exists is because of the AI controversy. <laughs> so, so yeah, I'm not really a horror film person. I, uh, I do think that they might have released it to get more PR um, because I just don't think it, I don't think that otherwise we'd even know it happened. Jeffrey? Yeah, I agree. Uh, it, it's definitely a stunt to uh, promote their show. Uh, being an actor in a movie that just got released last night called A Time to Die, uh, it, it, it just had the premiere. Uh, he, you know, you, as for production, uh, small production companies, uh, you know, AI is going to be something that's because all the actors are working for free. All the, you know, all the, everybody's technically working for free with a very limited budget. Having AI in there could be a good game changer to start with. But yeah, when you start getting into uh, uh, seasoned union actors and production crew, that's going to, that's going to change the game. And we still need to, to figure out where the middle end of the teeter totter is. Uh, when it comes to bringing AI into any type of production, and that's gonna that's gonna continue as we go. So if they can if they can make it, and then that's a good movie. That's a that's gonna be a great case uh, case use uh, for movies going forward. Next question from Pedro Gonzalez in Oklahoma. The Yolo Live Yolo Box Ultra All in One seems like a spiffy device. What are your thoughts on it? Is it a poor man's live view? Alex, haven't used it yet, but we'll tell you that all the Yolo Live products before that, or the Yolo um, brand products before that, have been kind of disasters for us. <laughs> so, so the uh, so we've we've had a variety of stability issues and performance issues related to them. So I'm not saying that this one is. Maybe they've found their way to something that's more stable. But man, the track record has been rough. So, um, so it's I've uh, you know it's everybody I know that's used these regularly have had enough problems that they stopped using them. So, so that's the only thing I would say. But it might maybe this one will be better, Jeffrey. Uh, yeah, and I haven't I don't have an ultra just yet. I, I've used all the Yolo Lives. I've been where I've worked with Yolo Live on some of these. Uh, you know, doing different reviews. My take is exactly the same. These boxes are great if you're using them for one for one or two cameras and then sending that to another switcher so or or uh, having a view some sort of viewer on a, on a camera that works well there and then that hdmi can then be sent to a switcher the ultra does do ndi uh and they they packed a bunch of new stuff on we talked a couple days ago about how you can actually do uh live streaming uh and how you can go through their uh their stream software to uh to send it out through the cloud uh but uh, with all those little options uh, once again you still got a small cpu inside of a box that can do a whole bunch of stuff. And when the Swiss Army knife has all the blades out, it's kind of a worthless Swiss Army knife. Next question. Hamza Abu Faraz from Marrakesh, Morocco says, I have a super micro TrueNAS server running. I want to expand it with an additional JBOD, just a bunch of disks. My VDEVs are four wide with ZFS Z1. 
My question is if the JBOD enclosure gets accidentally powered off and then plugged back in, do I lose the data in the Z pool? Mark? I don't know about TrueNAS, but most of the servers we have with RAID cards in them have the option of putting a battery on the RAID card to create a cache in case the power goes out suddenly. But I think more importantly, you need to have this on some sort of UPS so that it cuts the battery and protects the data. Alex? Yeah, I would put a UPS on my on my hard drive. It, it is the Z, um, ZFS is designed to be able to withstand something like this, but there's no guarantee that it would. Uh, I would ma never make an assumption that you could pull the power from a drive while it's writing and you would retain all the data. Um, you know, and, and so there's a there's a whole variety of problems that go on there. So uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't depend on it. Next, I'm sorry, Samuel. Yeah, and I want to consider something else than a JBOD if you really want. At least you have to have all your data backed up in several places because if one drive goes down, then you lose everything. Next question. Robert Green in Los Angeles says, Alex, would adding a live cursor or arrow to your Telestrator be useful? Alex? We, we've talked about it. Um, I have to admit that I like doing this <laughs> and I like the fact that it looks different then I don't, you know, it's, it's a, uh, I like the handwriting. So I will say that it, it, this is a personal opinion. There's a lot of other Telestrator apps and they put lots of other things on top of them. And, and here's the problem for me is that they create, um, they create too much thought process for the person doing it for me to do it. What I really want to do is look over and look at it as a whiteboard or a blackboard that's sitting over top of something. I like the look of the, the organic look to it. I like, I know I could add more features and sometimes saying no to features is part of the development process. And I've very much, there's a lot of features that we've added. This one has, you don't see all the features that Juan has added to it, but we've gone back and forth. There's a ton of features in this one that, um, that we're still kind of tooling out, but it, it, it is, uh, but they're all driven around performance, my performance of putting that together. Um, and so, so I, uh, um, I, I, I think that I, I prefer not to have to think too hard, you know, on, on making it happen. I've already filled up an entire, uh, I would have to add another, um, stream deck. I have a stream tech XL that's dedicated to all the buttons for all the things that I can do with it right now. <laughs> so, so I think that that's as much as, that's as far as the complexity is that I want to go. Mark. I think there's something about being in the middle of a presentation and being able to draw a natural era with that arc yeah. that you just drew and not having to stop and say, wait a minute, which button's going to put the arrow in? Plus, graphically, when you start to mix something that's canned with something that's a natural Kirk, natural writing, yeah. then uh, it just it's hard to do talent-wise. I mean, you really have to be good at that to do it yeah. right. Yeah, I've just found it easier over the last 10 years. I had things where I had the, we, we put in arrows and other things and I found it, I just found I never used them. I, and, I, and I like the, look, again, I like the look like it, it is, I am doing this right now while I'm talking to you, um, has a certain feel to it. So, but I do, I do, I, I think it's a valid, valid question. I just, that, that, that's the decision process behind not doing it. Next question. Roz Humphreys from Comax, British Columbia. If a movie were to be made about your life, which actor would you want to play you? Go ahead, Jeffrey. Well, let's see. I'd be uh, Paul Giamatti or Jeff Daniels. Uh, but if it's a younger version of me, I I think Barry Cogan would probably be the best fit. I don't know. Courtney? Uh, Rob Ryder. Yeah, I think he is. He's a few years older than me, but I'd be perfect fit. He has a big moony face uh, as the beard, you know, shoe in. Alex? <laughs> I, you know, if you're going to ask for anybody, Robert Downey Jr. Like that, that if I'm going to ask, like who would who would do it? I don't know why that would be the case. I was told many years ago when I was much thinner than I am now that I that I that I uh, favored him a little bit. So I was like, oh, someday if I ever have a movie, that'll be the guy. So I, that'll be what happened. I'm going to have to go with uh, Chris Pratt, but Parks and Rec days where he was a little a little chubbier <laughs> before he got all ripped for the Guardians <laughs> movies. Um, next question. Craig McFarland from Boston, Massachusetts asks, has anyone heard more about an SDK or API for the Insta360 link? Go ahead, Alex. We, we, I think we have it as the most requested thing. Uh, they put out new features, but they haven't given us an API that I know of. So I'm um, still waiting on that. Next question. From Douglas Carmichael. Douglas says, would an outboard headphone amp like the Rupert Neve Designs RNHP 
be a significant improvement in monitoring fidelity versus driving my headphones from the Yamaha DM3 headphone amp. Alex? Uh, I don't think so. Not not significantly. Not worth uh, not worth doing it. Um, r- really, where those headphone amps come in, in my opinion, is when you're using ribbon ribbon headsets. You know, so those are um, you know they the, that's gonna, they need a lot more power um, to do something well. Um, but but I don't think that for a regular headset and a regular production, you'd be able to hear the difference. Next question, Paul Lahus in Austin, Texas says. Comment on the eCAM partnership with Obspot and the Delta Hub to bring you the next level VOD casting setup solution. Alex? Well, I think this is what Insta360 Link is giving up by, by not providing APIs and connections is that people are going to start partnering with Obspot. Uh, Obspot, again, doesn't have great software. This is why we don't use it as often. Uh, but the, it has an API. I just haven't seen a lot of people using it, but it looks like eCAM is going down that path. And Samuel? Yeah, and also vMix has a similar solution. They have some integrations with both uh, Obspot and Insta360 Link. Next question. Guy Cochran in Seattle, Washington wants to know, if that Seattle studio was yours, what would you do differently? Alex? Um, I, I wouldn't use a pinning farm. I'd find another way to do that. Like I just, the pinning farms are, I just twitch when I think about them. Uh, I understand the thought process behind it, but I, I think I, I don't know if it matters as much as, as the simplicity and, and b- to be honest, the, the fidelity. I'd keep a couple of them so you can do teams and other things like that. But I, I would move, I would at least have two machines that were dedicated to just doing uh, Zoom ISO, um, you know, to, to make that actually happen. Um, I probably wouldn't use, I think the Bolero is a great setup. I probably wouldn't have used it. Uh, and the main reason for that is that I is that I think that the uh, I would have shifted down or not shifted down but over to FreeSpeak and use ClearCom for that because the software for ClearCom is so much better. So the integration of the software, um, you know, especially if you have a matrix there, um, the software into FreeSpeak would allow them to tie in their uh, their clients a lot more effectively. Um, so I I don't think that that's um, I wouldn't have done yeah I wouldn't have. Uh, I wouldn't be having my clients, you know, join over Zoom. Uh, I would have definitely, you know, we we have our clients regularly joining over Unity or ClearCom, um, and I have little instruction books <laughs> that I send out for them to use that. And it takes one show before they get used to it, and then they never want to go back to something else because they have channels and they can talk to people and, you know, th- that type of thing. Um, I would definitely have moved their, um, uh, they, um, uh, I would move the, their, um, I could hear a lot of noise in the in the wireless. I don't know exactly where that came from, so I just don't know what they're what they're mixing with and how that how that why we had uh, you know the amount of noise there. Um, I would build it up uh, probably a little bit more uh, extensively for IFBs, um, just because we had open speakers. I assume because there wasn't enough channels or or there wasn't enough something else to do there. Um, I would definitely move from the from the Panasonic's in a studio environment to the FR sevens. It'll look a lot nicer. Um, you know, I would probably create more space between the the tables and the and the back end. Um, the uh, but I think those are the probably the major the major things that I would that, that I would probably adjust as I as I watched it. It's an impressive space. They they do they they're doing a lot of great work there. But those are the things that if if I was doing if I was building it, those would be probably the first things that I that I looked at. Courtney, um, I thought it was very well equipped, very well laid out. Uh, the only problem is. I would look for something that is not two stories, uh, all on ground floor. I'd try and lay it all out so that the different studios are all on the same floor. Uh, because I worked at a studio once, which was a fairly large size stage, but it was on the second floor of a building and they had a limited size freight elevator. So if we wanted to get a Nike crane up there into the studio, which would easily fit, couldn't get it up there because you'd have to take it apart and bring it up in pieces. Uh, couldn't bring cars up to the second floor studio. They have their first floor now, studio now, now, for Courtney, this. I, I just want to say you couldn't get up, couldn't get a car up there easily. Yeah, so I say you have to take it apart <laughs> or stand it on you, end in the freight know, elevator, you know, and that's you problematic. <laughs> we put, you know, I put Jimmy Jim's on the roof of a of a, of a, of a building, so it can be done. I've it's had to bring things in, take out windows, and bring easily, things though. in with a crane See? into these things. But helicopters, yeah, I mean, there's all kinds all of options. on the same floor, so that you can just drive whatever you need right onto the stage. <laughs> The Dutch figured this out a long time ago. They have the skinniest stairways in the in the world, but they man, they got that little pulley right on that second floor window. Just bring it yep. on up. It's coming yep. in the front. Uh, next question. Paul Wahus in Austin, Texas says Grok has normal mode and fun mode. 
and they just added unhinged fun mode. How does Grok stack up vis-a-vis -vis all the other AI engines like Copilot, OpenAI's GPT-3 and 4, Google Bard and Lambda, TensorFlow, Google, Microsoft Azure, and others? Alex? Uh, yeah, um, I have not successfully gotten anything out of Grok that I thought was useful. Like I use GPT, and maybe it's that I don't understand how to talk to it, but... Um, but I, ChatGPT is useful every single day for me, um, and uh, and I have not uh, not found. I, I open Grok every once in a while, and I ask it a question, and, and it comes back with something that I don't, you know, I don't find useful. So that's that's my so far. That's my my input. Courtney, yeah, I've used Grok quite a bit, but I don't trust it at all. I've tried it, uh, and it uh, every time I've asked it a question, it goes wildly off the rails uh, in. Uh, and it sounds good, but it's not very accurate at all. So if you're looking for accurate information, Grok is not your guy. Copilot, I've found to be the most accurate. And uh, uh, when you put it in precise mode, which is using, uh, you know, GPT-4 plus some uh, retraining enhancements to keep it on the guardrails. You know. Next question. Roz Humphreys from Comax, British Columbia, says the Stuart tour yesterday was fascinating. Can anybody expand on the green screen plans to blend in? Alex, yeah. So the, um, uh, the what I would say is that um, it. I've done a lot of green screen, like thousands of hours of green screen, and I will tell you that it is difficult to do well. And so a lot of people go down this path of I'm going to add an Unreal set and I'm going to do all this green screen. And here's what will happen is either it won't look very good or when it looks good, you're so constrained by the situ what, you, what you've created that you're not able to be creative with the talent, with the content because, oh, well, we have to have the cameras in a certain place. We have to do this in a certain way. We have to do this in a certain way. And so you start tying up all, and I've done all of those things. I mean, I did, you know, hundreds and hundreds of Mac break videos with multiple cameras and all kinds of other stuff. And I've done it, or you're going to spend an enormous amount of money on it. Um, but, but what I will tell you is that, is that, you know, you're to do this well and not look dorky. I don't know another way to say it you really have to spend a lot of money and a lot of time. And what ends up happening is you're spending so much time on the infrastructure that you're not spending time on the content. Um, you know, and so that's, that's why we started moving away from it was that I felt like I was, you know, we were, you know, there were so many constraints that were being added to us having an authentic conversation about something that we cared about that I didn't feel like it was now what I like to do is have objects appear in front of me. So like, and that's much easier to comp. <laughs> it's much easier to track and it's much easier to do a lot of other things. So if I want to have something like a 3D object, like a dress, I mean, I know Ross works in, in fashion, um, that kind of thing, I'd rather have it floating in front of me than trying to put me into something because again, okay, now it's a lock off or if it's not a lock off, it's tracking and that tracking has to have, you know, and, and you're either spending a lot of money um, on it, you know, and, and you know, or, you know, it, it just, it just gets to be, you know, it's same thing in some cases with LED walls until you have the, the it works for ILM because they spent a lot of money on it. But if you're not gonna spend a lot of money on it, it oftentimes does not come out nearly the same. Mark? Just to tag on to what Alex said, we have a green studio here. And in the beginning I thought, oh, this is great. I'll get all the guys that I have that do 3D work to create these backgrounds. And then I discovered, hey, wait, we can't zoom the cameras in or out because the backgrounds stay the same. So, you know, you, you put this background in the Ultimat and it looks great, but then you got to go to the next level, which is bringing Unreal Engine in. And so I started to price that out and it was like $30,000 on top of the camera to set up an Unreal Engine server. And that's just 30000 per camera to get to work so that that set will move as you zoom the camera in and out. It's very expensive. Alex? And, you know, you can do it cheaply in, in the sense that you're not matching focal lengths and you're not doing a lot of those other things. I just feel like what happens is in, this, in the lower brain of someone watching, something doesn't look right. They don't know what it is, but something doesn't look right. And it just, it just looks, you know, off. And so to get to do this really at a level that, in my opinion, makes a difference, you need to really put a lot. Of, and Nick Jeshin's going to be with us. He's going to show us some of those techniques of how to do it. So we're not saying that you should never do it. Um, and we want to keep on learning about it. But I would say that if you're on a budget, like a budget under a half a million dollars, I'd think really hard on it. You know, like, you know, about whether it makes sense or not. Next question. Paul Wahoos from Austin, Texas says, enter Martin, a new AI butler and iOS app. Martin not only comes with a delightfully posh British accent, he integrates with all the tools you already use, like your search engine, calendars, and emails. Alex? 
And where is that data going? Even if he has an English accent, I'm not sure if I'm going to, you know, because an English accent does does give him an inside curve, I will admit. But but I will say, where is all the data going? You know, how is he making those decisions? How is that thing making the decisions? Um, I'm not a big fan of my calendars and emails going out to pretty much anybody. I really think this is what a lot of us are hoping for uh, out of Apple in June, is that we see some on-device AI that has a lot of guardrails against it so that we feel more comfortable letting our uh, our our very deeply personal things like our calendar and our contacts integrate with, uh, we hope we know who, but with Apple, we'd, we'd probably know who. <laughs> Next yeah. question. Tony Mobley from Noonan, Georgia says, what is the latest thing you have done with Sora? Courtney? I've looked at it because it's not available for us plebeian general purpose. I don't think uh, OpenAI has released uh, that uh, to the general public yet. They've shown uh, all the videos they've shown have been created internally. And I don't think anyone has uh, been allowed to play outside the studio. So we'll see. Uh, soon it will be coming, maybe. Next, next question. Craig McFarland from Boston, Massachusetts wants to know, how far away in years do you think we are when LED panels dot pitch is tight enough to avoid moiré and other artifacts? Alex? We're here. Uh, 0.9, mil, 0.9 millimeter, uh, up to 1.5 millimeter uh, at a reasonable distance behind the person is not going to create a lot of artifacts um, So or any artifacts. It'll just look good. So it can be done now. It's just expensive. You know, and the, the hard, really hard part about it is curving the, the screen because when the dot pitch gets super small, it can only go flat to the next one because there's no room to bend the panels against each other because they're, they're so tight. <laughs> so, so really when you see a curved wall, that's usually, I believe, about 2.3 is about the smallest most people go to get that curve. 2.3, 3.6, 3.2, um, those are 2.6, 3.2, that kind of thing, get you that curved wall. But that's the, that's the real challenge is curving the wall under 1.5 is almost impossible. Courtney? And they have problems with the dividers between the micro LEDs because they have to have a little little black shields between the dots so that they don't uh, spill light into their neighboring LED and cause blooming or, or you know, a diffusion. Uh, so they put those little uh, black surrounds around the LEDs and they're fairly delicate. So then you have to cover them with some type of epoxy or something that prevents them from being damaged. And then it starts to get a little wanky when you get off axis uh, to maintain the color accuracy because you'll be seeing uh, the, the little uh, black surrounding areas will be blocking off some pixels and other pixels won't be blocked off. So you end up with some uh, uh, funny colors happening. Also, the cur curved, I talked to the sound mixer on Mandalorian and she had a heck of a problem with that curved screen because it was a parabola and it focuses the sound and a smooth surface and it focuses the sound back and you get a lot of very strange amplification of certain frequencies and other frequencies. So you got to deal with the sound issues if you're recording live sound in the middle of that virtual screen, not to mention the fact there are about 4,000 fans on the set. Next question. Tony Mobley from Noonan, Georgia asks, does it make sense to buy compressor if you don't have final cut? Alex? There's definitely other things out there that you can use. So you have, uh, whether it's Handbrake or Shutter, both of them are, are front ends for FFmpeg. Um, those, and I think both of them are free because they're using something that's open source. Um, so, so I think you could look at those um, as valid options. And I think they're, they're really good. As far as simplicity, of, I, just, I, I just want to make things get smaller. I think Compressor is still a pretty good solution. And it doesn't need Final Cut to run. Next question. Zach Stallsmith from Chautauqua, New York asks, is using either a shielded Cat 5e or Cat 6 cable to connect a digital console to a stage box safe to do, or is running EtherCon the best thing to do? Alex? EtherCon's great. I mean, it's just, it's still Ether, you know, it's still, you know, you can, but I would, um, you know, I wouldn't use Cat 5e. I mean, we're, we're past Cat 5. So that's, that's old uh, technology. So um, definitely go six and above. And most of the time I'm getting seven or eight at this point. Next question. Rajan Chandil from Los Angeles asks, what software do you recommend for PC and Mac to validate and verify large file transfers between machines, servers, and cloud? Alex? Uh, I, I put my hand up a little bit too quickly because I was reading just validation. We A lot of times what we use to pull stuff off of our, when we're really, when it really matters is shot put. 
Uh, ShotPut is a software that will pull things off of your portable drives and put them onto a um, into a you know onto your hard drive and validate it on the way through. Um, as far as transferring very large files, I don't, I don't have a good answer for that. Well, that's going to wrap up another great Saturday of Q and A. We appreciate all of the producers for asking questions and keeping us all on our toes, making sure that we're uh, getting those questions answered for you. Also, thank you to the panelists for being here. Uh, all of us is always smarter than any one of us. So uh, thank you for that. And also thank you to the excellent crew on the back end, wakes up seven days a week to keep this show going. Uh, we couldn't do it without you guys and girls out there. Uh, also for the Tlaloc Traversal today, we've got 92,000 miles, 148,000 kilometers, which is 729 million bananas for scale. We'll see you in after hours. We had a question from Morocco. That was <laughs> awesome. That was awesome. It really was Casablanca so in from Casablanca at Ricks. We yeah, had it. it's at Ricks. <laughs> It'd be great. I really want to go to Morocco. I, I every person I've talked to who's been to Morocco just said it's amazing. Like it's just an amazing country, and I just it's one of the few countries I that I really want to go to that I haven't been to. Yeah. I used to have a foot stand. My my aunt went when I was like. 12 years old and she brought me back a footstand from Morocco and I had that footstand for a decade. Loved it. It was so beautiful and it got water damaged. So oh, no. Made of old camel guts. It was. Yes. was made. It was. I think it actually was camel leather. So. That's what they make everything out of. Yeah, exactly. So. I had to buy new luggage in Cairo once and it was all uh, not very well tanned camel hide. It That's smelled it. for years. Oh my goodness. <laughs> it did smell a little different but it was great. I 